Welcome, everyone, uh, to the Jones Seminar this afternoon. I appreciate everybody uh, coming on this dark and dreary day. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to um, have the speaker today, Matthias Coley from uh, MIT, who drove up this morning uh, through the rain uh, to give us his seminar. Uh, it's a real pleasure because I'm very excited about the topic that he works in and, and interested to hear what he has to say. Uh, just to give you his background, he earned his degree in physics from the Saarland University in Germany, together uh, through an interdisciplinary program with the University of Lorraine in France in 2006. Uh, he then went on to do graduate studies at the University of Cambridge in the UK in the Cavendish Laboratories, where he received his PhD in 2010. From there, he uh, received a Theodore Leinen Research Fellowship in the von Hol Alexander von Humboldt Foundation for postdoctoral studies, which he carried out at Harvard University in the School of Engineering and Applied Science. That's where he began, or where he continued his research, I guess, focused on bio-inspired photonics, bioimaging, and optical spectroscopy. After that, he joined the faculty in 2013 at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His research focuses on the identification of unique optical sensing, communication, and energy conversion mechanisms in nature, and the development of bio-inspired, adaptive, and actively tunable micro-optical devices. So. Uh, please welcome him today. Right, thank you. Right, and thanks for inviting me to the Jones Seminar Series. And I think I also owe Ethan a thank you, because he must have seen me talking and brought uh, me my talk to Brian's awareness. Uh, I had a wonderful morning and afternoon here. Uh, we spoke a lot about different things that happened here. Uh, I learned about full length therapy from Brian's work and from, from uh, Jeff Luke's work. <coughs> And Jeff, for example, has some of these, these amazing fluid particles that you can put oxygen in and then release it. And I'll show some about fluid particles in my talk as well. Can you hear me in the back? Is that clear and loud? All right, good. <clears throat> Should I move it down? I have a bit of feedback, that's why I'm asking. All right, is that better? Awesome, good. But I also learned about plasmonics, and I learned about a really interesting way of structuring um, materials with freeze casting, structural materials from Ulrich Wex. So I, I really enjoyed the discussion this afternoon. And so now I have the chance to, to talk about my research. Thank you for coming all. Um, the title, as you can see, is relatively vague and broad. It's biologically inspired soft and fluid optical materials. And I choose that title usually when I don't know what I'm talking about as I'm going up to the talk. Uh, it gives me the option to talk about any of my students' projects, because what I will show today is mostly the work of my students at MIT now. I've been there for four years, so I finally have things that I can show from MIT. Um, but there is a couple of keywords in here. Biologically inspired is one of them. And I want to set a bit of a tone of the, of the presentation. I want to start by asking you a question, because then I hope that you ask me a lot of questions back uh, as we go through the talk. So I'm fine with questions as, as they come up during the talk. So biologically inspired, nature inspired, has the word nature in it. And uh, it took me a rather long time to figure out what my definition of nature is in my research. I wanted to ask you, what do you think? I think there's still a problem with trying to do It's still? Yeah, yeah, we can't understand what you're saying. Oh, really? OK. Am I too fast, or? No, I don't think it's your speech. I think it's the sound system. It's very echoey. If I switch this off and I try to it, would that be an option? Well, this is on as well. I think that actually is better. Yeah? Yeah. All right. wasn't so important. Is that, is it, it's this one, I think. All right, turn this towards you. And if I speak now, is that something that is? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Good. OK, good. Good. And um, what did I say? <laughs> it wasn't too cool. Um, biologically inspired materials is the thing that, 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 that drives me out of bed uh, in the morning. Uh, and I have some definition for nature. And I was wondering what you think nature is. I put you in a spot and I ask you what is the definition of nature. I'll give you the Oxford dictionary definition afterwards. What is nature for you? I'm asking you a question because I want to set the tone for four questions in this talk. You should ask me. So I'll give you someone here. Nature is manufactured. Nature is manufactured. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Good. Anybody else? What, what? 
What do you think nature? Oh, sorry. The environment. The environment, yeah. That, that is definitely the, the definition. What do you think is the Oxford Dictionary definition? Would anybody be able to recite that? I had to learn it. Trying to recite. Um, nature is the collective physical world, uh, including plants, animals, the landscape, and any feature or product of Earth, as opposed to humans and humans creations. So it's sort of contrasting everything else to humans. Pretty exclusive, well, I'll take it from here. Um, it's interesting because there's two sides to it, right? It's, it's what we see in nature and what we can learn from nature. Uh, it's not my definition, I would not come up with this. My definition of nature is a bit more, let's say, diverging, and uh, it's probably not to into a dictionary. But I think nature is a pretty interesting treasure trove of experiments, experiments that have been happening over a long time, and uh, have interesting outcomes. Uh, these experiments happen in parallel, they happened across organisms, they happened with no particular reason, I think there was a lot of randomness, but it created a pretty wild and vibrant diversity of species and organisms and materials that we can look at. The other cool thing about nature is that um, if it doesn't work, it usually doesn't work. Right? That's pretty tough scrutiny on things, and uh, what hasn't been a good natural solution or good uh, invention from the natural organism has usually not helped the organism to survive. Um, so what's out there has, has some positive benefits for the organisms, and there are certainly lessons to be learned. Um, that's one thing that I see in nature. It's, it's sort of this huge random set of experiments that have been uh, conducted with no particular reason, but they have interesting outcomes for us. The other thing that I find very interesting is that um, there's a lot of materials in nature that we as humans could still work a lot better. Uh, especially in the optics when it comes to this. But I started with something else. I started with this material here. There's, there's two words here, elasticity and controlled deformation. There's also a title of an organism there. What's coming out there, I wouldn't have known that this is an octopus. If I saw this video the first time, I wouldn't have been written there. That is an octopus. It's in this beer bottle. When it comes out there, you can see it's actually an octopus. So it's just something funny. Um, and it also changed color right away. The reason I can go in there is it has no bones except for its beak, and the beak is the one structure that allows it to not go through a whole spoil in the end. Um, whatever I found in this bottle, I must have enjoyed it. It's done with it now. It has a friend. Oh, that's actually that's an interesting image as well. This one here you can find online. This video by Roger Hannon. I didn't check actually the country of the video. But this is the octopus there, and the octopus is also the cute. So it's capable of completely disguising itself, not only by changing color but by changing the texture as well. On that plant, on the left, is the octopus. It's a beautiful video. You should find this online. Uh, the video that I want to show you in terms of optics is the fellow here, also a cephalopod, the cuttlefish in this case, and it's capable of changing its contrast, its coloration, the white and dark colors of the skin, with a very high repetition. This is a uh, video rate. Uh, it's actually rich. In this case, it's doing it to maximize its prey. Uh, it's the flat that you will see in a second. Why if that works is unclear to me. It's like putting a kid in front of a TV screen. Apparently, perhaps it also doesn't buy movie pictures. But it seems to work pretty well as a, as a way of hunting a strategy. They're capable of doing that. The optics, just the optics. Because they have all these different features in their skin, in this soft and squishy material that can change color based on pigment bags that can be expanded and refracted, that can change color based on iridescent structures protein layers between cells that can be dissolved and, and, and rebuilt. And because of cells that have randomly dispersed particles that scatter light strongly in a broad spectrum range, they make what? Essentially, the octopus has its own white canvas on which it paints its colors. And in addition to that, it has muscles and neural uh, control to control not only the color, but also control the skin texture of these things. If you have to be able to make a material like this, I think that would be a great achievement. You could think about this in textiles, you could think about this in terms of energy management, in terms of heat management on buildings or anything else that you want to. Nobody has made it yet, even though some people claim that they're getting to it. I think this is an exciting challenge in, in the field. None of this is my work. I'm just showing it because that creates some like, excitement for, for myself, and I'd like to share it. Um, the work that we do on Mollusk is on something slightly harder uh, before we get back to soft. That's a little tiny animal, and that image is way out of proportion. The size of the animal is about the size of my fingernail. It's called a Blu-ray limpet for pretty obvious reasons. These Blu-rays are, are its sort of uh, signature. And the Blu-rays are actually not a pigment. Um, 
I want to stress here that this is work in collaboration between different scientific fields and different really uh, lean scientists. Lin Li is a material scientist who is now at Virginia Tech. He has a professorship. He is amazing at presenting his research, so you might be a good candidate for the next upcoming lecture. Um, and John Eichenhoff, who was at the time my postdoc advisor, and she is uh, incredible in terms of bimetallization and bimetallized by materials. I learned a lot from her. A lot of other uh, people, including my brother, who is a marine biologist, who actually happened to find this organism. I wouldn't have come across it. There was a question this, uh, this lunchtime as to how I find my projects. This one I found through my brother, uh, by pure chance. What's interesting about this organism is that when you take it and you put this in a microscope, light comes from where you see the, uh, the object, you see that these stripes change their brightness. They dim, they brighter dim again. And that is a clear indication that the incidence direction of light and the uh, observation direction is important. And that is a really clear indi uh, indication for a photonic structure, for something that's not based on a pigment, but on a structure. Now, we couldn't find any structure on the top of the shell or on the bottom. Uh, we looked for it, trust me. Uh, so we had to go a bit more radical and take that thing apart. That's work by Lin Li. Uh, I created this video that, that creates sort of statistic um, show and tell of what we have done. We cut through that. That's with Blender, right? Uh, it's really powerful. And uh, when we cut through that a little bit, as Lin does this, we see the cross section of it and we see features in the regions of the blue stripes. And for these features, then Lin took a focused iron beam. Um, microscope and took out a thin slice that he put into a transmission electron microscope. And that thin slice shows in very unique purity what this structure is that creates this photonics. It's a layer of architecture of calcium carbonate platelets. These calcium carbonate platelets are spaced by a very distinct spacing of about 90 nanometers. The platelets are about 110 nanometers thick. And um, it creates an interference film. It's like the effect that you know from an oil film on water. Except for now you have many oil films, calcium plates in this space for many water films. So it's, it's an amplification of a reflection and a, a constructive interference. It's like an optical field on the microscope, except for this is in the, in, in the, in the Nautilus shell. <coughs> this little feature here at the bottom is interesting as well. These are particles that are highly absorbent. And it creates those to make sure that the colors that are not blue, the reds, the greens, the yellows, that can translate through that uh, reflector, through that uh, multilayer structure get absorbed. So they don't come on again and uh, destructively in the floor, uh, sort of desaturate the color that the limit creates in the blue region. There's a couple of other images that I'm showing you here. This is a sort of larger scale view of this. There's about 50 layers. There's these particles uh, that, that create the absorber underneath the, the spectral filter. And that's something that we see often in nature, the interplay between absorption and uh, filtering with photonic structures. And here is an overlay of optical images and um, SEMs. Again, by Ling Li, and you can see these beautiful lamella architectures and particles underneath, right at the close edge, right underneath the shell, where things happen as S64. We take these images there. Well, I've done some optics, and that's been published in Nature Communications, and I'm proud of this paper. It's a, it's a really nice story. Um, we found that the reflection strength of this organism structure is in the blue range, about 480 nanometers, which coincides with the absorption minimum of water. Makes a lot of sense. If you want to use communication, you want to propagate this light the first distance in water, it absorbs. Then this is the range where you want to signal something. Poisonous animals actually in the water are blue because that color propagates the furthest. And so mollusks and things that are very distasteful often have blue patterns. Uh, we studied the structure, we studied the optics of it, we saw that there's particular emission characteristics. I won't focus too much on this. It's something that you can ask me if you want, afterwards if you want to. I want to show you this image before I move to something else. Uh, this image is one of the most beautiful things I've seen uh, from a natural architecture. It's this sort of mess, if you want, of a crystal of calcium carbonate that has these facets that you can see here. And the organism is capable of coaxing this material that's really hard to handle in the lab into structures that it needs to have. For the shell, for the mechanical buses, and also for the office. It creates these spaces. By changing the growth of this structure ever so slightly, there's an angle that it creates as it grows it, and this angle opens up these spaces and that creates the photonic architecture of the structure. And how that happens without knowing it, uh, you see a couple of features that are unique, these or unique kinds of in school locations. They hint at the crows. We're trying to get to this now uh, and understand how this happens. And I actually brought some critters, uh, not to show around, but um, these are the live limpets that I had in my lab a while ago. I have to I don't have them anymore. So 
at some point he had a crap infestation, and crap seems to like the insect, seemed to like his limpets a lot. Uh, so they got eaten before I could, uh, I could sign them. Actually, on the top corner, they see an indent of, the, of a crab on the limpet shell. Um, but when we had them, we played these tricks with them. Uh, we put little magnets on their back, and then you can flip them around into another magnet. And because they only have a half shell, you now can look at the underside of the shell, and you can look at things where they happen to grow. So they, they're sitting there in this little cell. We put a microscope objective there, and then we can we can we can see we can see that limpet, and it's not only happy, uh, but we can look at this image here. This is where things grow. Uh, you see the black horns and all these all these bluish color uh, the transmission. And we can we can do that at a higher magnification. We start to see features that are associated with these structures where the stripes are on there um, that might transport water in or stuff out. We don't know yet. We have no clue. But we're starting to get to a point where we are imaging to that level of uh, resolution on the live organism. And I hope that we, once we have the next batch of limpets, they live in live around the coast of England, so I have to check more on this. That's the thing itself. Uh, that we can start to visualize how these products get pushed down, uh, put down, and, and, and produced, how the number grow, and see things grow as they grow. That's very large issue, and then we have to start to move to the waters around how, how the present company can form the structure, and how it can, uh, can actually get so complex in its morphology. But I think seeing is the first step in that. All right, that's an example of, of studying a nature system. Um, I got into this by chance, and we are trying to make the best out of this now. I'm very curious about cards and company. But that's a hard material. And the title that I paid attention to was Soft and Fluid Body. So I'm going to give you now with this little uh, teaser story. I'm going to give you a couple of different stories on the uh, soft and fluid side. Uh, and I want to uh, stop here for a second and say something about the different things that we do in my lab. Uh, so that we have a uh, landscape where you can put this in. We have essentially three goals. Um, the first one being that we're asking what in optics, this is sort of our pastime for the most part that we do optics, uh, is used as materials or is not yet used as materials that could be used. Uh, we got a lot of this information from natural systems, the octopus, soft, uh, calcium carbonate is hard. Um, but there's a lot of materials, uh, soft and fluid nature, that could be imparting a lot of interesting optical properties. There's a selection of things that happen up on the top right uh, where you see things stretch and deform. Um, there was something to change color that I, I'll talk about more in, in a second. Um, but all of this is imparted by the very nature of the material being soft. So this marriage of intrinsic material properties, soft and fluid, and uh, structure to create optical systems, that's something that I'm very interested in. And we're asking what can we do with soft and fluid materials in optical technology. From the nature point of view, this is a slightly different organism. It's a chitin, not a limpet. Uh, about the size of my, of my sun fragment, this organism. Um, we're asking what can we do in terms of functionality, not on the systems level, as engineers usually engineer materials, uh, engineer devices, but on the materials level. Can we go and take the material and not just have it be strong or tough or be colorful, but engineer all the different properties that we want to have in a system into the materials level already? It's something that uh, you find in nature over and over again because organisms have a limited amount of resources and a limited amount of things to do with these materials. So they engineer materials highly to create structures and, they, and these sort of uh, properties that then create the functions that they need. Uh, so multifunctionality, what can we learn from nature in terms of getting multiple functions in at the materials level and what compromises do we have to incur when we do that? And the last thing that we spend a lot of time on the hardest, and that's where the limpet fits in, in terms of studying what happens as these structures fall. And can we learn something in the formation, from the formation principles of, uh, that appear in nature for synthetic manufacturing? And here I show an example of a butterfly that is just a closing. Um, might not have time to speak about it today, but uh, we have a relatively risky project, I would say, where we're trying to understand how structures form on butterfly wings. If that works out, that could be a really good paper. All right. There's two things I want to talk about today, uh, two specific projects, one on soft materials and one on fluid materials, that's the title. And I'll start with the soft materials. Uh, 
I want to talk about what you see here in a microscope image being fibrous. Uh, this image is in reflection, opaque fiber, and that is the same fiber on top in transmission. Uh, there are about 70 micrometers across in this complex. Very shiny and colorful, and I have a couple of other properties that I'll get to in a second. To answer the question as to why I work on these fibers, it's a bit of a twisted story. Um, a student is blue fruit. The name of this fruit is Bustard Hotberry. Uh, if you like to Latin name more, it's Margaritae nobilis. Uh, the less pleasing common English name is because uh, this fruit is found in tropical forests and birds eat it, but it's not very tasty. Uh, it's pretty much paper cellulose. And, and so uh, the bird doesn't get any nutritious value out of it, it's just tricked by the color. The color <coughs> comes from these little cells on the surface of the seed slash fruit, and these cells are elongated in their, in their appearance, in different layers stacked on top of each other in the structure. And what's really important is that each of them is filled with this concentric architecture of stuff. Uh, you see these layers already in here, and if you take a transmission electric microscope like uh, Pete and Alfie have done, um, you see a very regular architecture of these plants, so cellulose, it's actually not two different materials. When I first saw this, I thought you can say material one and material two to this, but it's cellulose that starts to, that builds these chiral architectures, the cellulose nanocrystals that are having these sort of, kind of shape, uh, rotate around as you stack them stack by stack, and that creates a pitch uh, that light can waste only light, uh, circular ripple light gets reflected. Beautiful paper also all of, on this from uh, Severino Lee in Cambridge. This work here is from Pete Vokusik in Alfie Lethbridge. And Pete, when I studied this, he knew that I was uh, into mimicking stuff in nature, simply spoken. Uh, and he asked whether we can do some of that. Now what caught my attention in this project is the following. What this fruit does pretty well is, is controlling its length scales. There's different ways of compartmentalizing these cells, different ways of curving the structures within the cells, and different ways of uh, controlling the structural pattern and pitch, and uh, meter heuristic. And that's something you find over and over in nature again. It's the control of length scales that are relevant to a specific function. Now, what function you're aiming for will define what length scale you should control best. Um, in optics, you can manipulate light by creating it. Bioluminescence is one of them. Uh, you could absorb light and you could convert light into other useful products of other uh, photosynthesis. All of this happens on the, if you want, quantum optical scale, small scale, a couple of nanometers. Two couple of nanometers. Um, if you talk about things like structural colors that I've been talking about in my talk for the most part so far, um, then this happens on a scale of a couple of hundred nanometers to a couple of micrometers. If you talk about writing and fluid transports, there's a scale of about a micrometer to about a millimeter. Let's say that's interesting. And mechanical robustness and activation there is a whole range of scales that you have to control optimally to create an interesting and, and useful material product. And the fruit is, uh, for me, one simple example for controlling features on different length scales to create a specific effect. In that context, what it controls is this periodicity on the nanoscale and curvature on the microscale. And what gains from that is filtering of light and color, it creates this blue color, but also from the curvature of the microscale, gains the fact that it can project this color into a broad range of uh, uh, angles and so be visible from a wide uh, range of directions. The simplest possible analog that I could come up as a physicist who likes to abstract things quite a bit, uh, so that they work, until they work, let's say, um, is to make fibers that have a multilayer cladding architecture uh, and a curve, so a cylindric curvature of this whole multilayer cladding. And that is sort of our take on mimicking this fruit. Curvature on the microscale, there is here a nanoscale, is what we have taken out of this. And that's about it. Um, we have put this into these fibers that we see there. And I'm showing the result very much at the beginning uh, because I'm pretty proud of the fact that we can make fibers that can change color, and fruit couldn't make that. So we went a bit better already. Uh, we make these fibers with a simple <coughs> uh, It's a so you can't extrude them, and you can't uh, necessarily draw them like people would make normal optical fibers or also photonic fibers. So what we do is we take a, um, a thin film of polymer that we spin out, and we spin a second thin film of polymer, in this case it's polystyrene, polyisoprene, and PVMS, polydamidine cyroxane. And when we have this bilayer, all we do is we take it onto a water surface. We lift this film off, 
and then we pick it up with a fiber and roll it up. It's not necessarily a scalable process yet, we're working on scaling it, but it works pretty well in making fibers of, um, on the order of 10 centimeter lengths. Depends on how large the spin coder is and how large the rolling device is, and that's about what we do, 10 to 50 centimeters. Um, we can control the color of this fiber, this principle. We can control the color variation across the fiber as we stretch it. I can get to this in a second. Most important aspect, this is the geometry that makes this possible. So we have the same or very similar structure as in the fruit, it's periodicity on nanoscale in these multilayers. You can see here, one material on the other, the VMS and PCR. And uh, we have this curvature on the microscale. So we have reflectance and broad angular range. And the color change now comes from the fact that if we were to be able to change the thickness of these layers, we were to be able to change interference conditions, this is in the top here. The wavelength that comes out in constructive interference changes as a function of, of layer thicknesses. So all we have to do is we have to compress or stretch these materials and then change the color. Now we can make them with different colors by just changing the spin coding thicknesses in the beginning. So these are static fiber images. Uh, the blue and the yellow fiber we saw in my first slide, that's the, that's the original data. We can make them green and the red reflection, so we have RGB. Um, the colors at the bottom row is just the corresponding transmission colors. So what we don't reflect, we transmit, and these are the complementary colors. So if we would now take both colors, put them back in the same spectrometer, we get white again, minus some small scattering. So it's a filter. But the best part is really that this filter changes its, its filtering characteristics as a function of um, how we put strain on this. So this is a microscope image of a fiber being stretched, and in synchronization with this, we have collected the uh, spectroscopic signature of the fiber. So you see the reflectivity changing as a function of strain applied to it. Uh, what's nice is that um, we are playing on a feature here, which you could con consider an optical sign and inconvenience. We have a relatively low refractive index contrast. And that means that we need a lot of layers that we can easily produce with rolling and make something of the order of 70 to 200, uh, 70 to 200 layers. Uh, but this narrow contrast means that the band gap is pretty narrow. A narrow band gap then results in a relatively narrow reflection peak, relatively narrow color sort of range that we reflect. And that means the colors are pretty pure. So we have the luxury of being able to make many layers and, and never get away with the low refractive index contrast and get pure colors out of this. And the reflectivity is on the order of 90%, and that's stronger than any pigment that, that you can find. Um, best part is that we can predict this color tuning. We can predict it based on a very simple relation that comes out of um, knowing Poisson spatial relation, knowing how the material that you stretch in one dimension compresses in the other two dimensions. And that's just written in the top part of this, of this um, uh, graph here. In the data, we show data from 15, 15 stretches. Um, the L bars are from these different lines, so it's pretty consistent. And the underlying um, solid line is uh, a predictive uh, fit, or is fit in this context. Uh, from this model up there, that the only fitting parameter is the Poisson section. And um, that Poisson section turns out to be 0.46 in this fit, which you would have expected for a elastomeric material. So I think it's, it's pretty cool that this, uh, this can be predicted and behaves exactly like you would expect it. Um, and that means that we can build fibers that traverse different ranges of color space. What I show here is images of the CAE color space. It's one way of mapping what humans can perceive optically with their eyes, uh, visually with their eyes. And in the top part, you see two different curves that we created by optical modeling of colors traversing to that space as a function of strain. So the <coughs> arrow indicates increasing strain on this fiber. And the bottom part are measurements that correspond to a fiber that we had to try to realize for creating exactly this color trajectory. So we know from the modeling what filtering is needed in fibers, and we can implement them in, in a material fabrication and then get the same trajectories. The um, darker disk around the points indicate the, um, the error bars. That data took us about a year to take. Um, it's testing how these fibers perform for many different stretching cycles. Shouldn't have taken us a year, but my student was very specific in how we have to build a setup. Um, it's a good setup now, but it took a long while. What the setup can do is it can measure stress, strain, and uh, the 
spectroscopic signature fiber as well as microscopic images, all at the same time while doing 10,000 searching cycles. And so what you see here is the result of, of this piece of work, where in the top graph, you can see the top drives uh, the deformation, the strain, essentially, the corresponding stress to this uh, strain, and then the wavelengths at which we have the refraction peak, this is red trace. And, and you can see the first cycle being blown up a little bit to show the different corresponding spectra in the, in the graph on the right. And then there's a cycle 10, cycle 100, cycle 1000, and cycle 10,000 comparison, and that shows that the fibers essentially behave the same as in the first cycle. So there's no difference. Um, it's really nice, they, they traverse the whole color range from red to blue, and you can see that the um, shift in wavelengths for any given strain position is very small. So it's very persistent as to where it ends up for a given amount of strain. It's four nanometers. Reflectivity stays relatively high up to a second thousand, and then it drops to about 70%, which is still pretty high, somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000. With Joseph, he built that whole setup. If you need optical mechanical code testing in, in that thing now, we can do that. Um, I want to use it for that privacy that I can now. Um, it works beautifully, but it took us a bit of time to put it together. Okay. What do you think that could be useful for? What do I make with fibers? What do I do with fibers that can change color in a structure? Strain sensors. Strain sensors. Awesome. <coughs> Fashion. Fashion, Joseph, yeah. <laughs> I, I, fashion was the first thing that people spoke about. Uh, when this, uh, I got interest from New Balance, from Nike, from Adidas. <coughs> None of them is giving money to scare that whole thing. So we're still sitting on 10 centimeters fibers. Uh, but they were interested in this. Um, my wife and I were joking that uh, if I ever get this to a point where we can make textiles out of this, it's a great indicator for whether you have eaten too much or not. Because <laughs> the stretch will, will be very nicely shown in the color, right? So, this is a bit of an anecdote, but um, I had to take a decision here, right? Uh, I had to decide whether I have my students, one of my four graduate students, work on scaling this model vector. I'm not necessarily knowing how we publish this, I mean, I guess I have to publish this as a young PI, or trying to, to hunt down an application and show the potential to get more people buying into it. And we choose to do the second, and the application that we choose to hunt down is this. Um, I got lucky talking to a couple of doctors at Brigham's Women's Hospital. And they said that one of the problems that I was aware of, and that's a pretty obvious problem, is that you can't measure the pressure inside of a bandage very easily. Bandages are things that we use for hundreds of years to, to help people heal their wounds, help people with venous uh, ulcerations, and the pressure that you apply is, is, is important in most of these applications. And, and so how do, you, how do you get an optimal pressure if you have a window of, say, 30 to 50 millimeter mercury, like in venous ulcerations, if you don't know anything about that pressure as you apply the bandage. So here's where we thought that maybe we have something in our hands now that could be beneficial. We have a fiber that changes color. We have a fiber that changes color in front of strain. But the bandage creates pressure as a function of the strain that you apply on that bandage as you wrap it around. So we have a relation to the bandage between pressure and the strain, and we have a relation between strain and fiber color. The linking point here being the strain. Up there is the fiber that we stitched into one of the bandages. And here's what we were hoping to get. We were hoping to, this is a very early bandage system where uh, one of my undergrad students was actually a huge guy who plays, who plays football, sitting there stitching these tiny fibers into tiny bandages. Uh, beautiful image. Should, I wish I should have photographed this. Uh, but this is what we want to achieve. We want to be linking pressure to color. And that sketch is purely fake. Nothing measured about this, right? Uh, but the goal, the, the goal would have been to get high pressure shown in red, good pressure in green, and low pressure in blue. Now we have tinkered for quite a while. Ooh. And um, this is what we can do so far. This is a data set of fibers in the bandage. You can see one fiber here. We stitch them on the bandage, and we're showing the peak position, the color essentially, the blackness of the reflection peak versus the pressure in this bandage. This is about the range, 30 to 50 mercury, where things are good for healing purposes. And you can see that our bandage fiber or in the bandage is designed such that we show this fiber being yellow in the good range. And then it gets blue when it's too high. So we didn't get it to 
go from blue to green to red, red being the morning color, they go from red to green to blue. So as it's textured, it gets thinner and you shift the colors. Uh, you can engineer to, to do the different thing, but we were, we were sufficiently happy with this so far. And my students went and, and did this. Um, this is just a model, but they were using these bandages on each other and other people that were volunteering, anybody who was, was happy, uh, willing enough to come in and, and be wrapped, uh, get wrapped. Um, with these bandages and try to see if we can improve the amount of pressure sensitivity we get and the amount of pressure reliability as we apply. Um, you can see three different bandages here that we tested. One that has no markings whatsoever, just this little line. Uh, one that has rectangles, and you have to stretch these rectangles to these squares and then apply them. And that's the only pressure sensitivity that you have. And then we used our fibers. And to these fibers, we added a color chart. Color charts would show you a color corresponding to a certain pressure. And so if you want to get uh, 4.6 kilopascals, uh, you would look at this color and then try to adjust this color in the fiber. And so here's the outcome of this data. Um, and maybe the takeaway here is that uh, for different pressures that you want to get an angle on Metcalf and on um, we seem to be with the fibers pretty good in hitting these pressures. And with the fibers, you often get a more narrow distribution of a pressure that we adjust. So it's a higher precision, higher accuracy, higher precision in this context. As for we can do with other benches. Now, my students are not medical experts. So, so we've been pretty naive about benches before we started this. Uh, but they seem to be getting it better with the, with the color fibers. But as somebody who does this for a living, it's better with fibers or not, we still have to test. Um, here's the state in a slightly different fashion. Um, from the ankle to the calf to the knee, and that's the other interesting aspect, you want to usually grade your pressure. You want to have high pressure at the bottom and go uh, lower pressure and lower pressure. And with the colors, you can achieve this relatively easy. Um, we get pretty good distinction between these different data sets, and uh, that is maybe another good set of data to point out. The pressure bias to what, uh, compared to what we want to achieve is the smallest for our, for our color fibers. So it seems that they can really help at least People that don't know much about bandages to adjust these bandages pretty correctly. Now, people that know much about bandages, even them, have a chance of about 30% to get it wrong. And that means 30 out of 100 patients get some optimal treatment. And so there's estimations that uh, for these 30%, that counts in about 2 billion of workdays lost in the US alone, and about 5 billion of, of, of expended uh, healthcare expenditure in addition to what should be spent with optimal treatment. I think that's a pretty significant uh, sort of selling point for these materials. And, and maybe these fibers can really give us control of um, bandage pressure in a very elegant fashion. The only problem is we now have to make much more of them in a scalable fashion. And we're not yet very good at this. Right, I have about 15 minutes left here. Cool, awesome. All right, so that was the soft material. We control the structure. That changes the color. And um, we have gone to a point that I'd like my lab to be more often is to show that there's potential for applications. Uh, this particular one in bandage pressure measurement. I want to shift gears now and go softer and softer. I want to go all the way to fluids. And I want to show you this dog. This I want to show you. What's going on? Maybe a good question is, what's the scale I wish I could make this in one micron. I think that would be really cool. Um, but so far, we get down to five micron in terms of diameter. This is a fluid particle, a two-phase particle, if you want, um, 100 micrometer across. And that thing changes, uh, changes substantially what my research group is doing at the moment. Um, it's sort of captured in this image. Um, these particles have the pretty neat, uh, Probably that they can focus 
light. They can, they can change how light propagates through it. It's a 50 micrometer small lens, an internal architecture that we can change potentially. That's a collaboration that is uh, born out of the capacity of Lauren Sasa, who's now a Penn State professor, and Chris Wagner, who's professor at MIT chemistry, um, to make <coughs> such materials, such fluid emulsions that have an internal morphology. We work with Moritz Dyson in, in, in Dresden at the Max, uh, at the, at the uh, Max Planck Institute for Molecular Biology and Genetics. And we also work with Joe Constantin of Optics Plus and Mechanical Engineering, and Danny Flaxstein in uh, Chemical Engineering at MIT. Now, again, I got through this to this uh, via a little sort of discourse. Uh, if you want. Um, the reason why I'm interested in these particles is that I like to think about vision every now and then. In my past time, I teach about it to some extent, and I wanted to make it some of research of mine as well. Um, vision is really fascinating. Uh, if you look at mammalian eyes, they are incredible organs, and they're incredibly messed up as well, because they're not quite the same like we would design as an optical engine. For one, you wouldn't put the receptors underneath a whole layer of tissue. Right? But that's what we do in our eyes. In our eyes, the top of the retina is up there in this, in this sort of artistic rendering, but the photoreceptors are sitting down here. And that, by the way, begs the question as to how you get light there with persisting uh, spatial acuity, without scattering through the, through the heterogeneous tissue. And nature has solved this a couple of different ways. Uh, there is cells that are called Miller cells or clear cells that act as light guns to get the light from the top of the retina through all these infrastructures on top of the photoreceptors. Now these light getting cells have nuclei, and nuclei are actually a little bit denser than the rest, and so they also scatter light. So these nuclei are bunched in these layers in the retina that correspond to these layers here. And these bunches of nuclei should scatter very strong. It's particulates, it's changing the fact of this is uh, quite heavy. And they do, but they only do so in diurnal patterns takes us, we haven't gotten the problem that we live in, at least not during the day, in light deprived environments, right? We have a lot of light to our disposal, uh, we can deal with a bit of scatter, a bit of sort of contrast loss because of that. Nocturnal animals, they are sort of starving for every photon they can get, and every photon that makes uh, contributes to the image formation, it doesn't get scattered. Right? And so what's interesting in the eyes, in these particular nuclei, is that um, in diurnal animals, structures that are like a biparticle, a dense outer layer that's genetic material, uh, euchromatine that's not used, that's packed tightly, uh, very <coughs> tiny active parts of the nucleus, which is less dense. So this dense outside shell, less dense inside part, is genetically more favored for the function of the nucleus. In the nocturnal animals, that's all swapped around. So the organism takes a hit on genetic side, on function of the nucleus, to create something that is getting it was the first approximation to a great refractive index lens. A lens that is more powerful because it changed the refractive index throughout this lens, and so it's stronger in focus. And what these particles, these, these, these nuclei do, is they seem to conduct light in a very elegant fashion towards the, the uh, photoreceptors. That's work found by Moritz, by Jochen Group, and by Christian Franzer in Dresden and at the University of Cambridge. And that inspired me for thinking as to whether we can build some of the systems artificially, where you can have particles that can swap in and out of the system, in a microwave channel, for example, and guide light through if you need it, and then remove them if you don't need it. We didn't get anywhere near for, uh, beyond modeling for about half a year with my student, Sarah, uh, because we didn't have the particles. Uh, I had a collaborator in Germany who said he would make them, he moved in sequence several times and never made anything. And I was relatively desperate, up to the point where Lauren, Lauren Sarsa, um, came into my office with materials that looked like this. Um, these are these particles that I showed you, this, this sort of mystery particle that changed its shape. This particle is built from a simple hydrocarbon, it's heptane or hexane, and a, a fluorocarbon. And that could be perfluorohexane or any sort of these proprietary solvents that 3M creates that are fluorinated. The exciting part about them is that you can change your configuration quite simply, as I'll show you in a second. Um, and if you can change your configuration and you have two distinct optical materials, capable of doing things where if the high refractive index phase is on the outside and the low refractive index phase is on the inside, you scatter light through these particles um, or you don't affect it that much, it's a bad lens. And if you put the high refractive index uh, material on the inside, then you get focus as you see on the right of this picture. This is sort of the same video that I showed you before. We can control the interfaces in these particles and you can control it simply by 
changing the contact angle here. This contact angle, the triple-phase contact line, is the only handle that you need to change the whole interface because you have two criteria that it has to satisfy. One is volume conservation, and the other one is uh, it wants to minimize the energy of the, of the internal uh, surface, so it has a spherical curvature, spherical interface, and so once you change this contact angle, you impose a new curvature, a spherical curvature fitting radius on, on this interface. And you can just change the contact angle by changing this factum ratio. There's two factums in that. One is for the plural common phase, one is for the high common phase. And if you change the ratio of them, we change that, that triple phase contact line. And in principle, you should be able to do this now with like most of these problems. As you change the interface on the inside, you're essentially changing the resonance behavior. That's all modeling. And so we set out with, with Moritz Kreising in Dresden, who also worked on these, on these uh, eyes, to essentially show that this works in practice. And it's not. It's very difficult to show that you take a microscope, you take this top objective, and you focus light in the back of its focal plane, its back focal plane. And that means you have a collimated light incidence on these particles, and you can then scan the field behind these particles to create a light field image. And I'm showing you slides of these, of these light fields behind particles for different topic configurations. You see that the focus can change, and this is experimental data that now shows that as a function of confirmation of these particles, we can control where light is focused. And then Sarah took this, um, took this a step further in, in my lab, and she built a whole microscope around these little particles to see how they would image, and how they would, uh, how they would capture light and images uh, created from it. So you see in this, in this little um, sketch here, uh, that's the, that's the rig that she's doing, and the image here shows that she has input image, a grid, that she projects onto these droplets, and then each droplet forms a small image of that object that you present. I'll brush over that relatively fast. We have control over the focal lengths. Uh, the effective focal length is here shown against uh, the inner radius of this interface. And that is controlled by the surfactant in this context. And we can get uh, negative and positive focal lengths. Uh, that means we can create real images and virtual images, or if you want, concave and convex lenses. DNA is relatively poor because one material is a low refractive index material. It's 1.29. and that is one limitation. We're trying to get to higher refractiveness materials. The imaging is relatively good, so um, even with low NA, as much as you can get with low NA, we get about, um, no, this is a very optics heavy graph. Um, we look at the point spread function here and the modulation transfer function. But these are measures as to how a single point source, top uh, right graph here, how a single point source would be uh, presented on your camera or your screen once it has gone through your uh, optical system. So it would be spread out. And the modulation transfer function uh, gives you how much of the amplitude of a signal, sinusoidal variable signal space, you get through as a function of the frequency of the signal. So you have two different things. The theoretical lines are here in dash line right line respectively, and then you can read out some resolution in the field. You get about four micrometer resolution for these, for these little lenses. Now, I was pretty excited, but Remember that I was uh, initially starting with this uh, from the point of view of having multiple lenses doing something interesting, like in the retinas. So what happens if you connect those? So Sarah was, was spending a lot of time working on single lenses. I asked her every time, what happens if you connect those? What can you do? And so she gave in at some point. She was uh, annoyed by, by me asking all the time. And she built an optical trap to assemble these particles and to see if she can just squish them in line and shoot light through them and, and satisfy them. Um, and that showed something that none of us would have expected. She brought us into my office, and I didn't know what I was looking at when I first looked at this. <laughs> so, so this is not something that I could have predicted, that she would have predicted. Um, we did frankly don't know what happened. It's not the first way that she saw this. It's an image uh, taken now with a 10x objective. And if you know something about optical trapping, then you would certainly not try to tell subjective trap because you don't have enough numerical aperture to create radiation pressure. Um, but we get these droplets react to that laser beam. It's an infrared laser beam. It's uh, 795 nanometers. And it's not optical trap because they react for too large of a distance, this 10 x object. And so we were sitting there thinking, what is it if it's an optical trap? Guess us? Thermal. So, there's something happening. We heat that ball in the 795 laser beam. It's just a little bit, right? The ball is not too absorptive there. But we heat it a little bit, and that, that tiny
tiny bit of heat is sufficient for these droplets to react with. So, so I put tracers into the solution. Uh, you see these particles here that are fluorescent. And you then switch on the laser spot, which should happen now, I guess. And you start to see some action around these power uh, on these it's, it's, it's indirect, but it simply flows. It simply flows around these particles. It flows the, for some reason rich, originate because of this of this heat gradient. And these are not flows that you would see in a particle that's either just the fluorocarbon or the hydrocarbon. So the, the, the controls are on the on the on the left side. Um, nothing in these flow fields suggests that there is any action that is not thought in motion. But on the right is our double particle, and there there's definitely flows that are not necessarily something that you would see uh, in, in a normal flow field. We I don't have a complete theory yet uh, in terms of being able to write mass down and everything. We're trying to work on this, but it seems to be really hard in terms of fluid dynamics. Uh, but we have a qualitative explanation that I'll share with you here. Um, what happens is that in this thermal gradient, we're exposing this interface that you see here between the red and the gray face, uh, the fluorocarbon and the hydrocarbon, to a heat gradient. And the surface tension is heat dependent. So if we have heat dependent surface tension, then the part that's going to be more close to the laser spot is going to be hotter than the part that's further away. And so the surface tension is going to be higher at the colder end. But the gradient of the surface tension is being higher there. It means that there have to be flows that, that account for this change in surface tension. And so we're starting to set up an internal flow field uh, that's going to start to move fluid into polygon. And that internal flow field is only going to be symmetric if the axis of the polygon, the symmetry axis, is aligned with the symmetry gradient. And that's where it's going to start to rotate. So the equations that go into this are a little bit more intriguingly complex and I don't fully understand them yet. Um, but there is some simple things that we can do. So the experiments that I, as physicists, like, uh, quite like thinking about is sort of letting droplets fall through lasers and look at what happens in their movement. This is like the Millikan experiment, the four droplets where they look at the, at the elementary charge uh, by stabilizing the droplets. What we're trying to do now is to get a sort of feeling for the forces that this thermal gradient exerts on the on the droplets by seeing what happens to them as they free fall. So there's no effect of the surface on which it's situated in the object. And um, you can see in the in the reference, obviously nothing happens as you would expect. And in that that one here, that force the laser gets slowed down and it gets pushed around a little bit. So these effects and forces that we can hopefully deduce from just this phenomenological observation of the droplet falling in the laser that tell us something about the strengths of this effect and how we can potentially utilize this. And utilizing this could be beneficial because uh, we know from simulations and some preliminary experiments that if we rotate the droplets around, change their configuration, we can change how they uh, essentially focus light and then change their focus. So we can steer that beam to some extent. For rotation of the droplet of, uh, on the order of um, 40 to 60 degree, we get rotations in the beam up to 20 degree. Now we get aberrations a lot of this, so it's not, it's not, it's massive. So we'll definitely have to improve this a lot more. <coughs> but there's a couple of cool applications that we could, we could potentially aim for. Right? One is um, we make things that change the configuration up on exposure to light. So this is a, a pretty neat system that, that Lauren and, and, um, and Sarah came up with, where they use an acid benzene surfactant can switch its configuration up on exposure to UV light or to uh, blue light. It goes between cis and trans, so its tail is going to be kinked or not kinked. But when its tail is kinked, its uh, property as a factor is different than when it's not kinked. And so by exposing these areas that you see in the smiley through photomass with UV light, we can switch these lenses to focus light stronger. And that means that the number of the scatter up more. Right? So we create this contrast. Um, on a large scale, it looks like this. For lack of a better pattern, we, we show MIT. Um, and what, what's really exciting here is that uh, if you see it from one position, meaning straight through the, through the sample of, of, of droplets now, you see the top image. Uh, but if you see it from a slight angle, you see the complementary particles. So we're not losing light, we're just sending it in different directions. And if we now dream big, we could dream of saying that each of the droplets could make a part of a pixel in the screen that's sufficiently far away. So let's say we have 20 droplets per pixel. And if I now could individually switch some of the droplets or bunches of droplets, I could choose in each pixel how much light I send into which direction. 
start thinking about this, and what I can start thinking about centrally three-dimensional displays because I can tailor the light field that gets emitted from, from this display or, or, or uh, scattered. <coughs> or I can think about screens that provide some information to the media that might not be the same as the information that I provide to the kid. <coughs> playing on this more, more complex screen, patterns of very simple materials. And the other direction we think we can go into is, um, and you might have much more to share with me there and, and to educate me on, is sort of imaging on a small scale. Um, I'm a big fan of, of tricks like light field imaging. Um, and I'm wondering whether we can use these particles, the, the adjustable focus, to create sort of a hybrid between non uh, or lens free imaging and lens based imaging. Uh, uh, each of these little lenses on top of the CCD would cater to a certain CCD area, and if you see an object uh, floating over in a, in a fluid channel, uh, you would get a different perspective of this object for each lens on each part of the CCD. So like the light field imaging approach. And then we can recompose three-dimensional uh, information of an object in, on a small scale. Uh, could work. We don't know for sure yet. The best data that I have is a couple of lenses and a couple of images projected through this lens for more objects. But we have to get a lot better with that idea and then show a lot more that this technique could work. We know, however, that we can make large carpets of these lenses on top of the surface that we are interested in. That's shown here, it's done with uh, microfluidic flow focusing. And um, it doesn't come out very nicely on this pattern that picture B, but all of them have about the same points per function. All of them, in this case, have a resolution limit of about five, six micrometer of these lenses. So we have a carpet of these micro lenses. And now we can think about what happens when we tune them all in unison or individually. What can we start in terms of imaging? All right, 15 minutes in. Um, I'll wrap it up here with a couple of slides to come as, as small like questions afterwards. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we can learn about interface defined functional materials from natural materials. Uh, Limpid is only one of them that I showed you. Soft materials have potential in optics because uh, the very nature of them being soft allows us to shape, change their shape and form after manufacture. And if that impacts on the optical properties, we have something dynamic in our hands. And if you want to go a step further and you look at fluids, I think they're also very versatile for optical systems, especially if you can now start to think about controlling droplets not only with two, but three or four phases maybe. Because now we're at the point where you start to talk about something that looks like an objective with several different lens elements in one drop. And so we're trying to currently get funding for small microscope objectives uh, in droplet form. Uh, there's a number of applications that we could aim for. Um, the advantages in using these photonic fibers is one application we're pushing quite far. Other things are a lot more in the sort of salt concept stage in my lab. But these are things that get me excited. Um, two minutes. There's a lot of things that I didn't speak about today. Um, there's two more things I want to say. The first one is four years into MIT. Um, very little of what I showed you in the slides is things that I have actually touched a lot of times. I'm touching all these experiments at least once so that I get a feeling for what this means. But uh, I haven't spent a lot of time compared to my students in the lab. They have all made all this work. It's Sarah, it's Joseph. They're up here for fibers. So Sarah's on the left. Joseph is in the middle there. They are leading these efforts on fibers. They work with a lot of student colleagues uh, that help them with all sorts of aspects of uh, mechanical properties of the materials, of making the materials, of measuring optics and mechanics. And then there's a lot of faculty, people that should be professors as well, here, um, that have inspired us in our work, me in particular. Uh, this is uh, John Eitelberg, my postdoc advisor, or Pete from Kuzik, who shared the food uh, information with us, or Moritz, who is incredible when it comes to biological imaging systems and images, um, or Ling Li, who, who is an incredible um, skilled researcher when it comes to structural analysis of materials. So biological structural materials is something that he does uh, with a great skill and level of art and characterism. Yes. Um, actually, Lauren is the other person I want to point out. She's a young chemist uh, faculty now at uh, Penn State, and she is one of the most logical and uh, clever persons when it comes to chemistry that I've uh, met in my life. All right, before I thank you for listening to all my talk, I want to make a little bit of a closing statement. Um, I think there's lots that we can learn from nature, and I make a tongue-in-cheek distinction as to how we learn. Um, one thing that you can do is you can see something out there in the open, and you can copy it exactly. Right? There might be some benefit in that aspect. Uh, it could be useful in some context. But I think the more appealing approach is to see it, to put your own thoughts and concepts into it, and then to build something that you wouldn't necessarily see in nature. But that's really useful. Right? And I'll leave you with this thought. Uh, this is sort of the side that I, that I like to work on. 
Thank you for your attention.